Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads. As always, uh, my name is Shane. My name is Connor. And my name is Mike. And we have a wonderful show as usual. Um, first off, uh, Connor, you were trying out Android Q beta, is it? Yeah. Um, I, when I was watching the the Google I/O, um, and they said uh, Android Q beta is available for all of these um, v- uh, phones and over there, and I was like, I recognise that logo. Uh, that is the manufacturer of my phone, which is the um, the essential phone, uh, which is actually quite surprising considering that they're no longer making it, and uh, you would think that the the company would be kaput right now but no apparently they're, they're doing the android q beta and i've still been trying it out it's it's quite interesting and i actually um noticed a marked improvement in my battery life so i don't know if it's specific down to this beta and in the full full release would it be different but um currently on this on this beta i'm getting a consistently a day and a half to two days where i was probably um i was probably hovering around the kind of day and a bit as in i I might end the day at about 30 to 40 percent battery um usually now i find myself um ending the day as like depending on my usage between 50 and 60 to percent uh even 70 percent on a really light use day so it's like i don't have to plug in my phone at the end of uh, at the end of the day i could go in into another day um so it's so consistently a day and a half a two two days battery life which is quite good yeah that's nice um i'd be interested to try it out myself um mike you're back with us um yeah. and contrary to what we said last time you were freezing your balls off in central europe not sunning your arse in spain yeah despite uh despite the difference in temperatures it was actually a nice trip i mean for me that's a family visit so i went to Vietnam, it was it was I fake went. news <laughs> yeah, it was literally fake news. Yeah, I went to Vienna. I went to Prague, um, and uh, you know we've seen a few museums. Went to the zoo as as I uh, as I recently started doing. So it was a good trip, and now I'm all relaxed and back and uh, ready to get back into the grind. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, as 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 you guys know, uh, Mark, uh, we kindly stepped in last week uh, or two weeks ago. Um, last episode last episode exactly <laughs> um, so coming up today we've got a, a few news stories uh, some some kind of important news in the Linux world um, with a very kind of political angle to it but we'll get into that I suppose then we've got a little uh, a little announcement later um, which is not a secret at all you guys already <laughs> know it um, and we'll have a little chat about that but first up um we have a coupon code for 30% off when you pay for three months of a Zara VPN, a security focus, focused VPN provider based in Sweden where the law doesn't require them to log traffic. They operate servers in Europe and North America. Their servers are owned, not rented, installed on location by their own engineers and running Debian Linux. They provide a WireGuard and open VPN option as well. Their client is GPL version 2 licensed and it's available on Linux. They take all major payment methods, including some cryptocurrencies, and you don't even have to give them your email address. So use the code LinuxLads when ordering. Be sure to hit the green add code button to make sure the discount applies, and that's valid until 1st of January 2020. So, first up, this is a, this is a really big one. You added this in, Connor. Um, yeah. The South Korean government might switch to Linux. Uh, they might pull a Munich. So we'll see how <laughs> well this goes. Um, yeah, that that's that that's very interesting. Um, I, I haven't read much about this though, so I don't know much about like the timeline or what version of Linux they're using, or if they're gonna like co- you know contract somebody else to do it or try to do it themselves. Yeah. Um, I think it's all speculation at this stage. I I probably know as about as much as as you do. We have the the articles that we we've we've read in the show notes. Um, it seems to be that the um. And, and some people have speculated that they might be doing this as, as a way of getting kind of a, a better deal from Microsoft as in, we might switch to something else. Hey guys, kind of give it a, give us a better deal here. Um, so there is that speculation or they, they could be committed and, and even if Microsoft come around with, with their better deals and everything and they must say, no, no, we're committed to this change. Um, 
hopefully they don't pull it, uh, Munich. What, um, so for clarification, Munich, what they did was they um, got their own in-house IT team to develop their own distribution of Linux. Ideally, what they should do is just go to a major Linux um, company and go to Canonical, go to Red Hat, go to SUSE or someone and just say, listen, we have X number of thousand computers, whatever it is, um, we were willing to give you um, an, like an enterprise contract, play, like pay, pay for enterprise support. Um, so they have a phone line to yell down the phone at if if something goes mm. wrong they have a point of contact and that's the, that's the way they should do they should go to red hat they should go to canonical they should go to open or or asusa or someone like that and just say listen um we're employing you to roll this out uh, on our on our enterprise um network um on our on our workstations and um, we're paying you, and if anything ro- goes wrong, you're the guys who rolled it out, so you're the guys who are going to support it. And that's the way it should be, rather than their own in-house IT team, because um, if it's reliant on their own in-house IT team, then there could be uh, security updates, there could be kernel updates, there could be anything like that, and it's it's their own IT team, which is tasked with the regular IT tasks such as freaking printers and all that malarkey so uh, ideally yep yeah, uh, get yeah. A, an enterprise contract with one of those big three um, Red Hat Canonical or SUSE or someone like that yeah it, rem- it remains to be seen um, <clears throat> who they actually uh, who they actually go with or, or what what distro they even use or anything but um <clears throat> so uh, like apparently this is you could be right on the whole windows 7 thing you were, you mentioned that uh but the uh, re- reading here in the article they said uh with 2020 bringing the end of inverted commas free support for windows 7 so it could be a financial choice for them but uh further down it does say that the switch will cost them uh 655 million dollars in us um so, you know, I, I'm like I'm wondering what the cost of uh, rolling out Windows Seven post 2020 is, or whatever version of Windows there is at the time that they end up using. But like, Jesus, yeah, that's a lot of money. Like, so I, I dread to imagine what Windows is going to cost them. Um, Mike, have you have you followed this I at all? I think uh, what they are uh, what they are worried about uh, when it comes to upgrading Windows to Windows 10 would be that they would also have to upgrade the hardware that they have. Whereas with Linux, I assume uh, at least some of the hardware would be still usable because the system requirements of Linux distributions are generally smaller than the ones of Windows. And uh, just back to Munich a little bit, uh, there are also... They, they obviously it wasn't the wisest decision to roll their own, but they also sustained pressure from Microsoft uh, because Microsoft didn't like what they did. So they sustained pressure from Microsoft for a lot of years, and it took a change in their local politics. The mayor had to be replaced with one with one that is favorable to Microsoft, and it took Microsoft to build a headquarters uh, in Munich or near Munich uh, for them to switch back to Windows. So I. If if this keeps happening around the world, there's only so many headquarters that Microsoft can build in uh, in the world. So, and I'm I'm not obviously even blaming Microsoft because they do what any company would do. They have to look after their business interests. But it is it is something that uh, South that the politicians in South Korea, whoever they are, would have to be prepared for whatever changes they make. There is always going to be a commercial pressure on them to answer for any and all uh, possible small or big se- uh, problems with with the solution they chose uh, if they if going with microsoft would be a comfortable choice for them because no one ever has gotten fired for it at least that's the you know the cliche and the asus wisdom but if they if they do go with linux that uh, they will have to be prepared for some pressure from from people who might not necessarily like the decision for whatever motives they might have yeah, I'm just my heart goes out to the people, just like the civil servants in in Munich and and in Korea who who have to go through all this shit. Like, because I know I know, like we all know from experience, if we've ever done an office job, that like major IT changes tend to be a bit of a ball ache. Um, so so just the just the people, just the little 
someone working in, I don't know, the Ministry of Feckin' Tax or something in Seoul is probably like, <laughs> they're probably like, oh, bloody hell, we have to switch. And like, then if it turns out that it was a negotiating tactic and they're switching back to Windows then in a few years' time, like, that must be really annoying, like, just on a personal level. You know, having to learn a whole new system and, you know, because we're just talking about normal office workers here. They don't have, like, I'm sure most of them don't have a bloody clue about Linux um, if they're not that way inclined. So, yeah, that, 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 that that's the kind of one thing that sticks out for me, just the personal element of, like, oh, fuck's sake, you're, you're reflashing all our computers all over again. Next up, uh, big political, um, political news. Uh, Huawei blacklisted for business uh, with US companies. Um, that was bad grammar. <laughs> um, so yeah, Trump banned US companies from doing business with Chinese phone manufacturers. I believe that was like uh, banned tele- American telecoms providers from purchasing equipment from foreign companies, uh, something no, like that. Completely doing business. So if you are Qualcomm, you, I mean, it. it, it depends on representation. So the big companies will go to their lawyers and say, what does it mean to us? And the lawyers, after reading and charging a lot of money, will point out the course of action. And the course of action, at least when in, in many big companies like Android, uh, Google and uh, Qualcomm, seems to be, no, you cannot do any business with, with Huawei at this point whatsoever, or at this point when it becomes effective in, I think, August or something like that. So uh that means and, and companies that are not necessarily based in us uh and associations that are not necessarily fully based in us are also looking into it and just uh, not letting huawei into their business anymore so that that goes from uh, arm to carriers to the wi-fi alliance to uh to chip makers you know it's it's a massive, uh, massive revolution in or, or revolution. It's a massive upheaval of the status quo because Huawei was one of the, or if not the biggest mobile phone manufacturer in the world. Uh, number no, two. Number two after Samsung. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that is that's a massive upheaval. That's crazy, and and like Huawei only really broke into the Western market in the last few years i guess because like uh, i didn't uh, really uh, see any uh, of those phones uh, uh, yeah in terms of handset um but in terms of network infrastructure they've oh uh, yeah, yeah yeah they've been here for at least a decade oh for yeah, sure the, yeah the plug-in modems the kind of small stuff that you get from your operator or uh the big stuff that the operator uses to build uh networks that's been here for a long yeah time. i suppose i suppose the big takeaway for for us here though is uh is the uh the os that they want to create instead so because they want to break ties with android um or kind of the situation has forced them to i guess they yeah they don't want to they would love nothing more if they could just stay keep the things as they are because as far we don't know much about the new operating system as far as everybody is speculating the system is nowhere near ready the apps might not be there now there's obviously two ecosystems one is in china where they cannot use google stuff anyway I mean, like Play Store and the Play Services because they are blocked in there. So that's a different market. But if they want to keep on uh, selling phones all over the world without Play Store access and without the services, they have to provide a really good alternative. And as far as anybody is guessing, they are not quite there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easier said than done, I suppose. Um, Connor, you added this. Uh, have you been following this at all? Uh, I have been following as as the um, as the news has been coming out. So there's the news has been coming out, and then there's like, oh, there's another thing, and then there's another thing, and then there's another thing. So um, so in case anyone has been living under a rock and is completely unaware of this, uh, I'll break down my understanding of it. Is at first it was the the software, so pe- people like Google with their with their Play services and things like like that, and obviously access to um, Google Android as well. They would have access to the still the open source project AOSP, but um, so it it came out that um, 
that oh it's 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 the Google software and they won't be able to have access to uh, upgrade their phones to the latest version of Android if um if they're on a previous version, um so as far as I'm aware, if you have a Huawei handset at the moment, that operating system will still work. You'll still have access to the 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 uh, Play Store for at least the the next ninety days until August, possibly longer. Uh, it's just the case, uh, and Huawei will still be able to issue security updates if there's any security vulnerabilities because they still have access to the to the Android open source project, so they can still code their own um, security patches and and so on for the for that version that's running on your phone. You just won't have access to an upgrade to the next version of Android. So whatever version of Android that is on, it's stuck. It's static. Um, uh, as far as that's concerned, I mean, Huawei's could have their own custom version of, of, of the Android open source, um, project when, when that new base that Google releases, they can take that and they can do their own customizations on top of it and then release that as an upgrade for your phone. But, um, you would have, uh, lose access to the Play Store and the official Google version of, uh, air quotes, Google version of Android. But, the, but so that's uh, basically the Norway model of AOS beers, and <laughs> <laughs> and but then freaking um, the whole the the ARM news and the the Wi-Fi Alliance news, which I've only just literally only just heard about the Wi-Fi Alliance thing today. The ARM news I I knew uh, for a couple of days, but the ARM news is is complete another freaking hammer blow because that just means that uh, the, essentially um, ARM are a UK based. Uh, company and what they do is um for people who are familiar again unfamiliar again I'll I'll try to break it down as much as I can um is they develop uh, the the chip architecture and they have designs and then people buy the license to those designs and then go out and manufacture them so arm themselves don't really manufacture any chips bar a few reference chips like we're talking about maybe less than a thousand is something that they would or possibly even in the hundreds of reference designs that they'll they'll print they'll manufacture themselves but other than that it'll go out to people like samsung or uh, qualcomm and they will make their their chips based on arms designs arm are effectively saying well, uh, in our, even though we're a UK based company, we're using some US technologies. So because we're using some US technologies, we're going to obey this new, this, this blacklist. And so that means that, um, Huawei are effective. Huawei do manufacture their own ARM chips, um, just like Samsung do. So Huawei for the, their next anything that's in development at the moment in terms of their next chip are essentially up shit's creek because they they can't um they can't they don't have the license to manufacture new chips you 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 actually mentioned something there that i i found interesting that i had never considered before um so because of this this ban um the the android updates like the ota updates um so if you have if you're on a an, an American carrier, say you're on Verizon or something like that, um, like you won't actually be able to get updates for your phone after a certain time. Is that correct? If it's pushed through the carrier, as far as I'm aware, that would be correct. Um, the manufacturer may, uh, which in this case would be Huawei, uh, could uh, bypass that and could push the updates themselves. Um, I think. Google has been trying to do that with Android, try to take it away from the carrier to make sure, um, obviously if, if the carrier is a bit lazy with issuing security updates, which it looks bad for Google because people are saying, oh, I have this uh, phone that hasn't been updated for six months. So Google is now saying, okay, we're, we're going to, um, yeah. So the, the, the Google has been trying to get around that, uh, try to take the, the carrier out of it. So if Google is, is able to get around the carrier, then I would imagine the OEM, just like, uh, Huawei, sh- uh, should be able to, uh, get around and should be able to push their own, uh, updates, but it just won't be an official Google air quotes update because they don't have access to that software. They'll just have to wait until the, uh, open source version of what Android Q or the next version of Android comes out and then base their operating system on that and then then issue their own 
uh, version of it of or their own um, new update for the phone. It just won't be air mm. quotes Google Android. Because I, I remember when I had a Samsung phone, the uh, the Android updates were always later than everyone else because Samsung took the latest version of Android and you know Samsungified it and added all that shit you never use. Like, because Samsung phones are ridiculous for bloatware. Um, at least they were when I was when I had one. But like, uh, I, so I can imagine. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Perhaps it won't have as much of an effect as as you'd think because they can just, you know, the only stumbling block I can see is perhaps like, uh, you know, firmware updates for the actual hardware in the phone. That, that there might be issues there. Well, it might not have. Uh that much effect on people who already bought one but if you are if you are buying a phone today in Europe or in the US I think people are quite unlikely to buy Huawei because uh, you know if you should you for example in future lose access to play services that's your Play Store gone, your apps, your maps gone, all the stuff that most people use. Even even third party applications use Play services, some of them, and so that's that might uh, that this might be pretty much a nail in the coffin of uh, Huawei in in the Western world, uh, or it might not, because like one of the news that came out yesterday is that Trump is considering that Huawei or very dangerous Huawei, as he called them, might be a part of some kind of a trade deal. So he's basically taking them hostage in his uh, weird negotiations with China or whatever this this war, not war, deal, no deal kind of thing is. So it's, to me, the most important news from all of this is how vulnerable the Android system is or any how vulnerable our pretty much whole uh, uh, mobile phone uh, ecosystem is to uh, the problems of capitalism and uh, to nationalist interests. Like if one country can basically at least try and seriously hurt the second biggest manufacturer of mobile phones in the world, that's not okay. And uh, if one company, i.e. Google, can be pushed by the government into uh, breaking ties with this with this company, and can basically switch off the most important, some some of the most important parts of its operating system, uh, just because the administration in one country wants it, that's not good. We need something a bit more open source. We need an open standard that is truly international with no national oversight on it uh, a trade on organization something like the linux foundation preferably not based in the united states that would oversee a mobile phone base uh, that I, I suppose like yeah i mean i suppose we already have stuff like that for the internet we have a uh, you know ICANN, which is an international body regulating domain names um you have uh, you know the you know the www consortium or the W3C, whatever you want to call it. Um, those are all, those are all transnational, international, whatever you want to call it, bodies. So yeah, yeah you're right. Like there, there's, I don't, to my mind anyway, there isn't such a thing for, for the mobile world. Well, we have we have this base for servers, right? We have the or, or or at least we have the kernel that runs even on the mobile phones and everything. We just what is needed is some kind of a second layer that all the manufacturers could use nobody would and it would not you know not user space but something between the kernel and the and and user space that would be uh that that everybody could use and freely contribute to and then the manufacturers could put their uh could put their all modifications on top of it so uh i think that's badly needed there should not be a single company and a single nation that just uh, that just dictates to everybody what um, what the market is going to be. Um, I, I I'm not saying that the the this um the access to the Google services is I'm not I don't wish to un- understate the that effect. Uh, I'm not saying that that won't be a massive blow to them. It will be a massive bl- blow to them. But I I would imagine a company the size of Huawei would be able to weather that storm. 
they would they would they'd be able to survive afterwards. I think the uh uh the arm news, the lack of access to their their the uh the license to print chips is a, a is a fucking hammer blow and a half <laughs> to be to be perfectly blunt because software sure it could set you back um uh, two to three years while you you develop your own operating system or whatever but access to freaking hardware could set you back to five ten years no yeah you're right uh i, I definitely see that point and uh, given that uh, the two other chipset manufacturers, even if they had mobile phone-ready chips, uh, i.e. Intel and uh, AMD, are also US-based, uh, I don't think there is a way out from Huawei unless they have got a Plan B for chips as well. I don't know how. I don't know the licensing agreement they have with ARM. I don't know if they have to stop using uh arm or the or the or the blueprints for the chips or if they can build upon them or if they can if they paid for, for, for what they have and they can build upon it or if they would have to go smash everything and start completely anew i don't know maybe they should go to risk five oh, i was just going to say that risk five is, <laughs> is is open hardware um even even if if uh i i think the whatever foundation or whatever is organizations behind it might be US based I but that is idle speculation off the top of my head but even then it shouldn't really matter if it is open hardware um uh, so effectively it could just they could do whatever they want if it is, uh, if it is based on risk 5 um but if they they would not be able to hardware iteration is not that quick even if they even if they had something in the plan b or plan c based on a risk five somewhere in the works it could take them at least five to ten years to freaking ramp that up to production level yeah i was i just researched that their risk five were started in the uh the cs department at the university of california berkeley yeah, the, uh, the, so that speculation was right, but uh, yeah, even if, even if the uh, the foundation is US based, as I said, it's 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 open hardware, so um, the the politics of that shouldn't necessarily affect Risk Five because of the openness. Just like the fact that they're free to use the Android open source project because it's open source, um, Google don't have control over that, uh, or Trump doesn't have control over that, um, but. Um, so it's open; they can use it, but it would, it would take quite a lo- uh, a few years for them to to switch over to pivot over to that. Well, be, as be always, the solution yeah. is to open source everything. <laughs> be very interesting to see how this pans out and see how what sort of effect it has on the mobile industry, because I I, I think it's it will like it will have quite a significant impact. Um, one that we like or don't like, I'm not sure to be honest, but but yeah. Um, and this is all purely just speculation because nothing has ever, has been announced yet. But it's the uh, um, Huawei is the only Chinese company that's been blacklisted. But there's plenty of other um, Chinese companies that a lot of us use. I mean, um, OnePlus, our Chinese company, Lenovo, freaking the people manufacturers of the ThinkPads, they're Chinese. Um, so, uh, could, hopefully, none of those are affected. But uh, hopefully, it's just limited to Huawei. But you never know what Trump and his freaking mad hatter freaking power drive. He might uh, add more people to the blacklist. Uh, which would be fucking nuts because that uh, it would literally um t- turn the entire IT industry to complete another shambles that uh, that could take years to recover. I mean, on an industry scale. Let's call a spade a spade here. Like Huawei is not exactly a victim here either. Like oh no, yeah, yeah. Tr- <laughs> <laughs> like like we we like yeah. They they they've most definitely got their part to play in this. And no, the Chinese yeah, government, you know, they they are accused of spying and everything. But is there? There's no. This is the problem with the whole thing. Uh, there is no courts. There is one person, albeit the most arguably one of the most powerful people on the planet. But one person says, "Well, I don't like these people," and the business goes. Like <laughs> that's not, you know, if 
if we are okay, if we were to do this properly, then Huawei there would be there would be some kind of a court, not a nation based court, something above that level, that would decide, investigate what happened, and they would be capable of doing business until proven guilty, right? Not none of this oh I want to start a war today, so I'm just gonna spread the shit this way. And maybe tomorrow I just press this button. You know, it's 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 annoying. It shouldn't yeah. be. And yeah. there's there's ton of people who are working for Huawei all over the world who live their life who have got now lost some part of their security because they wake up every morning thinking, Well, maybe in a year's time I won't have a job. You know, because it, this could this could damage them. I know they are big and everything, but this could damage them. If it go, if, if it goes on forever, they lose a lot of business, or if the Chinese government, for example, decides to throw them under the bus for the sake of deal with Trump or what, whatever, you know, uh, it's it's not a good place to be. And uh, I I don't think this is fair. Obviously, it's politics, so it, nobody says it would be fair. But uh, yeah, it's not it's not the way it should be done. Yeah, and it's it's really indicative of uh, the difference between the U.S. and the U.K. Like in the U.S., it's like a ban, you know, an executive order. There you go. Whereas in the U.K., the, you know, there's it's a little bit more subtle. You know, there was inquiries and stuff like that in the government. So yeah. Um, well, an, an, another example. Admittedly, there is a smaller company than Huawei. Uh, Huawei's um, a massive company, uh, as we've said, number two in the world. Was um, ZTE was on the Trump's naughty step for a while, and it very nearly killed the company. Um, apparently, they're actually, appar- yeah. apparently they're apparently um, they're no longer on the naughty step. So I think there's there's still there's they're on the way to recovery but it very nearly killed, killed the company mm. because um, Huawei manufactured their own chips but um, ZTE were almost entirely reliant on Qualcomm for their for their chips so if if uh, if say Trump decides to ban everything Chinese what are we what are we meant to meant to meant to use like what is not actually coming from there even if he decides to what if he decided to ban Foxconn right that's that's not only Chinese manufacturers' mobile phones. That's also Apple gone, and uh, everybody else. So uh, it's there is he's damaging a market without. And even if we like not talk, even if we uh, leave the point that uh, that is not a fair or just thing to do. Also, there are no alternatives. This kind of damage. This also damages customers. So Huawei sells a lot of phones in Eastern and Central Europe because they are cheap and good for the price, right? If that goes away, who's gonna step in and uh, fill that niche? Or are people just meant to uh, spend the extra five hundred or a thousand euro to buy themselves a phone that's not completely crap? It's it's all bad. Yeah, it's 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 too heavy-handed for sure. Like the like that's. Well, that's fucking Trump's signature, isn't it? But like, um, like, yeah, it, it's it's just too heavy-handed. It's too disruptive. Um, like Huawei have questions to answer. No, like, there's no doubt about that. But like, yeah, it, as you said, it's 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 disruptive. It's affecting. You know, it's not it's not the right way to go about it for sure. Uh, I've not not. Uh, this is entirely a rumor, and I don't think anything has actually happened uh, yet. I've certainly seen no he- um, headlines, but uh, I've strong speculation that if Trump is saying, "Oh, Huawei are bad, we're banning Huawei," and the Chinese government are going to go, "Right, well, we're banning Apple." <laughs> well, that. <laughs> but then, yeah, no. This kind of tactics only ever hurt the hurt hurt the people. Anyway, I've I think I've rented enough, but yeah, no, it's 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 a shit show. That's what it is. Yeah, I think uh, maybe we'll move on to something else because uh, you know there's a lot of a lot of aspects of this story that should just make my blood boil a little bit. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Mike, you stuck in. Uh, my, Firefox sixty seven is out, so that's a nice that's a nice yes, story, isn't good it? Good news, finally. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, it, uh, it's another iteration of the world's best browser. Yes, I said that. It's uh, You're right, though. Yeah, yes, it is. it is the world's best browser because everything else is 
just the other browser. <laughs> uh, no, that's not true. That's unfair to the other projects, obviously. Uh, but Mozilla Firefox has got version 67 out. Uh, according to them, it's meant to be faster. There's a new version of some audio, audio video codec that I don't know anything about because I don't rem uh, understand that shit. But it's meant to be also better for your video playback. It might be why Shane is uh, capable of connecting to, uh, to Hangouts in Firefox. Uh, know, as, right? as he as he pointed out, uh, because it wasn't possible before, and now it works. So maybe next next uh, time I'll try that as well myself, rather than using the uh, the, the 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 Chrome browser, which is what I'm using now. Um, they uh, I don't know if that's I've never noticed this before, but when I upgraded to Firefox 67, I got split view. So you can basically you now click a button, select a tab, and you have got you have got two web pages side by side in one window that's amazing that that I think should have been there for a long time because if you are researching anything uh, this is my favorite feature of the whole thing uh, at the point at this moment you can't really resize it so one of them is significantly smaller and it kind of defaults on many websites to a mobile phone website uh, but this is like uh, this is this is Mozilla using something for the researchers. Uh, I don't know actually if it was just coming to think about it, it might not have been built into Firefox 67, it might be that Firefox 67 started recommending um, add-ons for me and I could have recommended this one uh, and I installed it and now now it works that way. Well, I've just dug myself into a hole here. Anyway, um, other improvements are to the dark mode, apparently, which I don't use. Uh, Connor, you've used it. Did you notice any improvements to dark mode? Um, I'm well. I'm on the full disclaimer. I'm on the 68 beta, and as you were talking, I I was clicking around and I didn't see the the split tab um, functionality. But it could be just something that blatantly obvious that I'm missing. But in in relation to your point, um I've I do use a, a dark theme in Firefox and I haven't really noticed even uh, even though I'm I'm on sixty eight beta and I'm, apparently I'm on the, the the version that's after this announcement, um the newer version, I I haven't really noticed any real improvement in terms of um oh uh, for me ultimate um Firefox where it breaks down, where it falls down, um, when it comes to a dark theme is when you're on a website that has any kind of web form where you're filling in information. Yes. If, if you yes. have a, if you have a dark theme, it completely messes that up. Either, um, it'll, it'll, it'll make the, the background of the box that you're filling in text black and you're filling in black, black text on top of that. Or as I've, I've found out a couple of times, is it will make the text white and the background color is white. So literally I have to, I have to highlight the box to make sure that what I've typed in is actually what I think I've typed in. Um, and I'm on 68 beta and as far as I'm aware, they've not fixed that yet. <laughs> so, so when they say they, they've improved dark, dark team support, uh, it might not be that specific web form bug thing that that seems seems to still be an issue in sixty eight better. I think what they kind of said that if if there if Firefox is in the dark theme and the website has got a dark theme, uh, the Firefox will now be able to automatically select the dark theme. If I'm not mistaken, I'm making this up completely. But uh, yeah, I don't I don't use dark theme, so I can't really test it. Uh, but uh, actually, that's not true on the Pinebook because of uh, residual configuration from a desktop environment that got deleted. Uh, there is the Firefox basically, even in i3, is still in dark theme mode. And I did notice that on a specific form exactly that happened that I couldn't see what I was typing because it was black on black. So, yeah, I. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's a fairly common complaint with any sort of dark theme. Um... I've an, I enabled the uh, dark uh, window theme in uh, Ubuntu, and I do notice that sometimes. Uh, it's yeah, it's quite annoying. Um, I've in the past, I um, I have admit, I will admit that in the past, it's annoyed me enough that I've I've freaking switched over to a secondary browser that is um, for just that specific web form. Um, 
uh, for it to another browser that's based off Chromium, like Brave or or um, Chromium or Opera or Vivaldi or one of those that's based off Chromium, just for that specific web URL that we- that one I've I've switched to a second browser. And like this, just annoying me so much. I just have to freaking switch to something else. Um, but then I want Firefox to succeed. I want Firefox to be my main browser, and for the most part bar that an annoying thing it is and i i i'm going for them i that's where 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 my where my moralities lie as i want firefox to succeed because it's uh, it's an open source browser that is not, there are other open source browsers but they're they're based off of chromium web engine and firefox is doing its own thing i don't want the uh, monopoly of web engines so i want firefox to succeed but seriously mozilla, mozilla fix that fucking bug I'm I'm in the same camp. Like uh, like Firefox would have to get really really bad for me to stop using it because, as you say, it, it's it's a philosophical choice. It's not a usability choice. Um, there are faster browsers than Firefox. I'm sorry to say, but speed isn't really all that important. Like, what's a few extra milliseconds? Like, so I don't really care about that shit because, you know, obviously it's philosophically aligned with my thoughts on technology and software and everything. So. So yeah, I mean, it it would have to get damn near unusable for me to get for me to switch to anything else. So you know, I'm just kind of every update, I'm like hoping, please make it good because I'm gonna have to use it anyway. For me, it's a pragmatic choice as well. In that, uh, if we stop using Firefox and should Firefox die, there will be one choice exactly, and that's bad. That's like objectively a bad situation to be in. Uh, so by supporting it, uh, we are kind of future proving ourselves uh, to uh, for uh, you know we are future proving ourselves. But uh, having said that, I mean Firefox is not bad. I have to use uh, for some stuff. I have to use Google Chrome because there is that kind of uh, perverted IE six situation where certain developers of like business apps only develop for Chrome and because it's so poorly developed it only works in Chrome. And uh, I don't see that much difference between Firefox and Chrome in speed. Uh it's to me it's pretty much the same. Uh maybe they need to make some more improvements to rendering, but if you if you compare the company the size of Google uh and an organization, albeit Mozilla, which is fairly big, but if you compare the browsers, to me they are pretty much the same level of quality, and it's an amazing effort from Mozilla that they keep Firefox this good, they are keeping on improving it, and uh, yeah, just uh, may yeah. they continue. Yeah, I mean, in, in my, my own experience, uh, having tried Edge, uh, Edge and Brave as well. I've noticed they're quite fast. Like Edge is surprisingly fast. Um, like and it's noticeable. Like you will, you'll see. You'll see, go to YouTube, for instance. That's always a slow loader. So, yeah, you go to YouTube on Brave or Edge, and it, like, you'll see a page render kind of on Firefox, and you'll see it rendering. You know, do 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 do. Maybe one, two, three, four. On Brave or Edge, it will just appear. Like right there, um, it's 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 a noticeable improvement. Point of clarification: Edge is not yet uh, based on Chromium. Uh, I think it's on mm. their development or beta channel. So unless you dev- uh, downloaded that specific version, mm. um, which I think you you alluded to with the Linus video um, earlier, was uh, he's doing his testing on. I think it was the either the dev or the beta. And mm, it's in order to quite do a while person. since I used Edge now, but this is just my experience at the time. Yeah, so it's I don't think it was based. It's not based on Chromium. I have that just from... no, no. It was just like the reworked Internet Explorer at the time. Okay, uh, next story, Mike. You put this in. Uh, Antergos Linux project ends, unfortunately. So Antergos is no more uh, um, after seven years. This is this is sad news. The developers basically don't have any time, any more time for developing it. Uh, Antergos obviously being uh, the Arch Linux based uh, general desktop Linux distribution. Uh, I've tried it several times in the past. It was good. It 
that's you know it it was good good choices for desktop environments good usability i i always rated it in one of the top let's say top six to five distributions for me and uh it is said that they they don't have the time but they are shutting down nicely they let the people who use it uh they will there there is a migration way where they switch off the repos uh, back to arch and uh, it should be as, low, as at least as envisaged, envisaged it should be all smooth transition to plain arch uh, obviously people's lives change and uh, if they can't carry on at least they are doing it the right way they you know they didn't just turn everything off from one day to another and uh, there is a plan so people who use it uh people who use uh, uh people who use uh, antergos will basically transition to arch if they don't like that there are alternatives uh, for uh for uh, the other arch based distributions basically that they can use there's a some kind of a list going to be in the show notes yeah um that's yeah as you said it's a good it, it's it's always sad to see see a good os kind of shut up shop um but as you said like the the transition is is very considered and very uh smooth so uh, i i have absolutely no doubt that this will be forked in some fashion um i think it's that kind of project i think a lot of people really liked it so i i can definitely see it being forked for sure yeah, this is this gets her um sad trombone. Um I I'm run, full disclaimer, I'm running Antigos on both my desktop computer that we're 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 doing this podcast on and on my laptop. So when I found this out, I was like, Oh shit, what what the hell is going to happen here? But I'm I'm glad that the there is a, a, a nice smooth transition path as in just keep doing your updates and eventually you'll just point to back to vanilla arch i'm not i'm not saying that they were that removed from from vanilla arch they uh anyway they just had their own one or two of their own repos but they'll just gradually turn off those repos and then say okay these packages will point this in this direction now so when you when you do your usual updates you'll just get it directly from arch um so it's the case of relax if you have it and install at the moment it won't be broken um it will all be smooth seamless in the background and as shane was saying um i'm sure there will be some kind of fork that is will try to continue on the philosophy of it uh they may even keep the same name uh i, I don't know what kind of friggin um uh red tape red red tape or bureaucracy or anything like that is maybe somebody will just say well, we're we're taking over the project we're continuing continuing it just like um just like uh the community took over the solace project so it is possible they kept the same name uh, it is possible for the community to take over yeah i was i was thinking that myself i was like it, 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 a fork i was I, my mind was solely focused on forking but then it was like sure if they could just get a new maintainer like that would, that would be cool there is uh, the question of the community. There's always been a very welcoming and helpful community in uh, in Antargos, you know, welcoming to newbies and uh, seasoned veterans uh, alike. And uh, it was always a good place to go to. And I think the, uh, the current maintainers are saying they are going to be shutting down the forums and the wiki. Uh, maybe they basically say they don't anticipate keeping the forum and wiki operational for more than three months so uh they these the, the, these people who formed a community around those two web ba- services they will probably have to move somewhere maybe they could uh maybe i don't know if they are going to be assimilated into arch or if they are going to create their own but it would be nice to preserve this uh, this nice community of people that uh, Antargos has always had. I mean, I, I suppose the, the spiritual successor would be Manjaro. Would that be correct to say? It's slightly different. So Antargos was always sailing very close to the arch wind, if you are in uh, for a bad metaphor. Uh, they 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 basically took whatever arch produced, uh, put some, uh, edit some of their repos, and it was the same kind of uh so what you got in arch you had in antargos 
pretty much, if I understand it correctly. Manjaro has got kind of a buffer, so they do a bit more testing. They try to make the, they try to soften the kind of harsh uh, rolling release uh, environment for people. So if so, if, so Arch releases something, Manjaro tests it adjusts it needs if it needs and then releases it some at some point later that's not to say that it's not very similar it's still arch based the, the many of the philosophies are still there and still the you know the uh the community in manjaro again a very nice community uh there are other alternatives based on arch i think connor was very helpful in researching it so there's arch bank there's artix uh there's chakra which i don't think is based on arch anymore but it's close to that paradigm as parabola uh f they all have got kind of niches right so uh, parabola is for free software lovers it's a bit like uh the, it's a bit like uh, uh, um pure os and there's isn't there triscal as well to, yeah to... yeah it's like those basically G uh, fsf kind of people uh archbank is prides themselves on being lightweight they use open books as their uh, Windows manager. Yeah, I Manjaro. used to use Archbang. I, I quite liked it. Yeah, there is there is a lot of to be said for a snappy Arch. Arch, Arch based distros are generally fast, in my experience, at least. I've not tested it, but it's my use 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 experience. And if you put a lightweight uh, desktop and not even a desktop environment, if you put a lightweight uh, windowing system on top of it and make it all work nicely, that's that's a one snappy distro. Uh, you know, they have got. Uh, there's an uh, there's an alternative for people who don't like system D called Artex that has got some kind of a different init system. Uh, I think there's like a Black Arch, which is a pen testing distro. So there are uh, there are uh, many many alternatives. Most of them seems to be specific for some kind of a use case. Your I, I see your point that Manjaro is the kind of general uh, distribution because Manjaro has got plenty of different desktop environments for plenty of architectures, for example. So I can run it on my desktop at work. I can write on my Pine book uh, with different configurations for each machine. So maybe um, you're probably right. Manjaro is kind of in the same general computing distribution for, for users space as uh, Antergos was. One point of um, clarification is, as, yeah, I, I would imagine that some people uh, could... Um, if nobody takes up the Antikos, um like if the humanity don't take over and no no fork happens, nobody else fills that niche, I would imagine that there'll be a split in the community. Some people um, liked the fact that it was very close to Arch and like, well, I might as well just switch over to Villain Arch. And and some some might like the fact that Antikos had a nice uh, GUI installer and just click, click, click and, oh, I want to run KDE, click. Or, oh, I want to run uh, GNOME, click. Oh, I want to run XFC, click. And then it downloads that kind of nice installer, uh, which uh, uh, Manjaro doesn't have it in the installer, but I think it has the various different flavors that you can, you can download. Um, so... Parts of the community could go in one direction, parts of the community could go in the other direction. But uh, the way I describe it is if using Debian as a base, as an example, um, um, and Antrogos was kind of like something that's based very close, to, uh, closely off uh, Debian, for example, Linux Mint Debian Edition, or there's Sparky Linux and a few others that are based just pretty much just based off Debian with a few niceties on top of it. Whereas uh, Manjaro isn't quite as far removed uh, um, uh, uh, from Debian as as Ubuntu is, but you can get the idea. It's it's kind of Manjaro is a more user friendly um, version based off Arch, as in yeah. they 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 take the Arch base and then they do their own thing. They run their own. They write their own. Uh, GUI tools on top. They do their own in-house development, that sort of thing. So, friendly as, arch. <laughs> yeah, a, a friendly arch is is kind of exactly like that. So, if you can imagine, uh, Ubuntu is based off Debian, but they do a lot of their own things on top of it. Um, of the um, Ubuntu with Canonical is it's, it has its own machine behind it, so it's it's not quite to the 
removed as Ubuntu is from from Debian, but you get the idea. Manjaro is kind of we're we're taking this base base, but we're doing our own thing with it. Um, so uh, it isn't a natural successor to Antigos, but some some of the Antigos users might like that aspect of it and might switch over to Manjaro. Or, or and as I said, some Antigos people liked the fact that it was very closely based off Arch, and they and so they might say, "Well, I might as well just use Arch." Yeah, I suppose I, I I've always had that uh that tendency to maybe it's just because that's where I started out, but uh you know a, a Debian based distro always feels more familiar to me, and it's always something I I prefer to use because I've gotten used to the package manager and stuff like that. So you can get um, your apt apt get on exactly, yeah. So you can get your you can get your uh, yay on uh, if you're an Arch user. Yeah, and for a exhaustive for a not maybe not exhaustive but for a very very long list of both active and inactive arch based distributions uh, where else to go than to arch wiki uh, the list the website is going to be in the show notes but there are so many of them that i've never heard of something called like arch file uh, ctlos linux yeah, morpheus I, I, arch yeah. I'd love to go exploring in the dungeons of Linux distros and, you know, find <laughs> out, like, all these completely fucking random distros that nobody's ever heard of, like, because there's thousands out there and, like, there's probably all sorts of batshit stuff out there that would be hilarious. Uh, top, this this com- Russ A. This is completely off the top of my head, so this might, might be wildly inaccurate. Uh, I'm sure um, we'll look this up and put it into the show notes afterwards. I think the, the pen testing one, one might even be called Arch Attack or something like that. There are There's more than one. So there is Arch Strike, previously Arch Assault. Arch, uh, it could have been Arch Assault. Uh, then there's Black Arch Linux, which is also pen testing. And I'm pretty sure there are others uh, uh, because the list is massive. Like that's that's a lot of things that I've never heard of. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kali Linux is the go-to pen testing one, and that's based off Debian, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, well, either Debian or Ubuntu. I don't actually know. Uh, I, I, I think it's Debian. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I can't remember. I, I, I actually had to ins- uh, use a a virtual machine of Kali Linux in college, um, for uh, an infosec class. And yeah, it's super cool. I don't know what it's based off, but yeah, I just wanted to say it's cool. <laughs> um, so, um, I think we have talked about quite a lot. So, um, we want to let everyone know, if you guys don't already know, that we will be at, uh, Foz Talk in Ooh. London on the 8th mm-hmm. of June. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, so uh obviously that that actually falls on a weekend where we normally record so i'm not sure what we're, so it remains to be seen if we'll have an episode out that weekend or not or if we'll just do the fuzz talk one uh we'll decide that and be sure to let everyone know i'm sure um so yeah fuzz talk you guys here we are and nearly a year do, later if- if you if you don't get an episode that week, it just means that the false talk recording was so fucking terrible that we just said, no, 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 we're not doing that, no. <laughs> yeah, w- w- whenever Joe gets it to us, we'll we'll be sure to get it to you. I I, I cannot uh, because I've been to false talks before, and I know that it's a uh, a lot. There's there's a lot of um, let's say drinking and general pub activities going on. I don't think we will be even if even if we just got the recording immediately after on the Saturday, I don't think we'll be able to publish it on a Monday as we do usually. Uh with show notes and everything. I'm not too sure about that. Yeah, so don't worry, we'll keep everyone posted. Keep an eye on the Twitter. Keep an eye on the Telegram group if you're there and uh, we'll be sure to let everyone know. But yeah. I guess we will wrap it up because we've actually had a bit of a bumper episode uh, this week. So um, as as you all know, we're pretty rubbish at uh, sticking to <laughs> sticking to a, a specific running time every week. But um, but yeah, we just we just go where the episode goes. So uh, as uh, as usual, um, you can support us if you go to linuxlads.com forward slash support. So if you want to throw us a few quid for a coffee or a beer, whichever you fancy, um, feel free to, uh, I believe there's a note thing on the PayPal. Um, so if, if, if you want to even leave us a little bit of feedback that way as well, um, that'd be cool as well because we really, really like feedback. 
Um, you can catch up with us on Telegram. So uh, you can get to that via the short link. That's linuxlads.com forward slash Telegram. Um, on Twitter, we're at Linux Lads. On Facebook, we're, I believe there is a short link, linuxlads.com forward slash Facebook, but I think that's also facebook.com forward slash Linux Lads. Um, you know, just to cover all the bases. Uh, Mastodon, I was, I was actually informed that we, the short link doesn't work. Oh, <laughs> is really? that true? <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, well, or maybe I did. I maybe it was when you were on holidays. <laughs> but, um, but the link to Mastodon will be in the show notes anyway, if you fancy getting us there. And of course, you can email us on show at linuxlads.com. Um, so, men, any final thoughts? on this most wonderful episode. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a fairly bumper episode. So, yeah. yeah, we're very chatty, which is unusual for a Saturday morning. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think uh, if there's nothing else, we're going to wrap this shit up. Um, thanks for listening, as always. Um, hope to see you at Foz Talk if you're making the trip to London. Um, as always, reach out to us on the socials. We love to hear from you guys. Um, we love to chat. Um, so, yeah. I've been Shane. I've been Connor. And I've been Mike. See ya. Bye. Bye.